Um, she's the chief medical officer uh, at Clue. Hi, Lene. Um, Hi, how are you? Lene? Be here, thank you for the invitation. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's great to have you here with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here and to learn from you all. Oh, um, well, I'm sure we're gonna learn from you. Okay, next we have um, Frederick from Circle Biomedical. Um, hi, Frederick. Hi. hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, and then we have uh, Irene Rapti of, of Inne. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Normally, we should have a fourth panelist. Um, I don't quite know where he's gone, but hopefully he will join us soon. Um, but otherwise, in the meantime, uh, I think we said we were going to kick off the panel with a short presentation from all of you about what your startups do. Um, starting with you, Dr. Brayboy, um, about Clue. Maybe a short introduction first. Oh, um, Pascal is here. I'll let him on when he requests to join. But yeah, um, so Clue uh, is a doctor recommended free period tracker app, which is built in collaboration with top health researchers. And Dr. Brayboy is a specialist in reproductive endocrinology, infertility, obstetrics, and gynecology with clinical research focused specifically on femtech. Um, you have the floor, Dr. Brayboy. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Okay, super, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I, I want to just first say kudos to all of you as students. I remember my time in medical school and I didn't have a, a concept of what you could do outside of the clinic. And so this is really exciting to see that you've all gathered uh, to really see how you can innovate in medicine. So hopefully I can shed some light on what Clue does and I'm excited to take your questions afterwards. So Clue is a period tracking app and we have um, 13 million users around the world. We're available in 15 languages and we're all here talking about Femtech which was actually coined by Ida Ten, our co-founder and chairwoman now. And so I don't have to explain to you what Femtech is. Uh, we have leadership uh, that is uh, really interested in innovating in this space because we've all had the experience of living as a woman. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of um, research, there's not a lot of support for women and women's health. And we want to change that. And we're on a mission to empower women and people with cycles, with science, data and technology, no matter how they identify. And so we, I often will say women and people with cycles because we want to be inclusive of everyone. And actually, that's our core value. So we're inclusive. We want to be for all people with cycles because everyone with cycles needs to have access to health care and it needs to have access to actually high quality information about their reproductive health. So our other value is that we're evidence-based. So um, I remember being in medical school and we did a lot of things because that's what we always did. And at some point there was a, a clear and direct change to more evidence-based medicine. And that's what we do at Clue. We try to have all of our, our branding, all of our product, all of our, our content be in line with what is the latest and the newest technology and reproductive health. And the other thing is that we really value our users' privacy. And so we, we have never and we never will sell our data of our users, and that's part of our company ethics. And that's why people feel um, comfortable sharing their data with us so that we can spread that data uh, to academia and only into sources that will actually help improve women's health overall. And so what is Clue? So I did say it's a period tracking app, but we do have 13 million users. Um, we have about 290 million periods tracked and 10 million data points. And again, we're in 190 countries, but we're more than just the app. We actually have a subscription model where you can have specialized, personalized in-app content about pregnancy. You can track symptoms in pregnancy, which is very important, especially for clinicians who are taking care of patients in obstetrics and gynecology. And also it helps with symptom prediction. So Clue Plus offers a little bit more than our free um, period tracking model. And then we have HelloClue.com, which is an encyclopedia for menstruation, sexual and reproductive health topics. And we have more than 450 evidence-based articles that are mostly written by clinicians and fact-checked by clinicians and scientists alike. And that's really important to us. We also have something that might be really great for some of the students in the audience to learn more about reproduction is to listen to our free hormonal podcast. And we have two seasons where we have experts in reproductive health talk about everything from contraception to abortion to the birth of the birth control pill. So please check it out on whatever um, 
platform that you use to listen to podcasts. And then we also, you know, I think I want to talk about why period tracking is even important, right? There are some things that we just take for granted. Um, in period tracking, you know, when I was in medical school, it was always how, how do we date the pregnancy? How, how do we know um, how far along someone is? And this is a really big challenge in obstetrics and gynecology. In residency, and even now um, as, a, as a physician, you have to know exactly when to deliver someone. And you don't know that unless you know their last menstrual period. So, you know, doing period tracking is really important. And so here are some examples, because if you know exactly when the last menstrual period is or the LMP, you can accurately date the pregnancy. And if someone wants to terminate, then you can be very sure of where they are and you can offer them perhaps a medical termination as opposed to a surgical termination. Also for infertility, so we heard a lot about infertility just now with the opening of the session. It's really important that people who present to an REI or a reproductive endocrinologist actually have an idea of their menstrual history. And that's really hard to obtain unless you've been tracking. And so as an REI, as a reproductive endocrinologist, I encountered a lot of patients who really couldn't give me a menstrual history. And we know that this is extremely important to help us pinpoint what could be the cause of their infertility and then direct their treatment. And then of course, secondary amenorrhea, which means that someone had a period and then their period stopped. And this is really a cause for concern. We need to work this up in the clinic. And so if you're not tracking, you can't really tell your provider or your physician when exactly your period stopped. And so this is really something that could be as something as simple as someone may be pregnant, or it could be something as, as, as dramatic as them having a brain tumor. So really tracking your menses is really important to your overall health. And recently a study came out in the British Medical Journal that says that basically those who have irregular and very long cycles basically have an increased risk of premature death. And so this is really important, I think, as a marker of overall health. And, and the menses is an indication of someone's um, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis being intact. And so tracking really is important um, from that standpoint. So tracking from the first period, the menarche, all the way through menopause to make sure that those periods are regular. And if they're irregular, that there is a, a, a proper evaluation workup that's done. So this is, you know, who we want to support. We want to support individuals and in, across their entire reproductive lifespan. And so that's all about Clue, and I'm happy to take more questions. Oh, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about me. I, I did research in Femtech before I came to Clue. So I graduated from medical school, and I'm a physician scientist. I work with oocytes. I'm an oocyte biologist. And these are just some pictures of my life before Clue and now what I do at Clue. Um. Yeah, uh, for you to share, I'm just gonna. Um, hmm. Because um, we're five on screen, I have to remove somebody. <laughs> um, um, and just, yeah, real quick, somebody who has facility, uh, Frederick, I'm gonna remove you and then bring you right back on after. Because, yeah, cool. I'm trying to get. Um, yeah, I think now I'm you trying to be able to share, share screen. Yeah. yeah trying to stop sharing, but I can't find my window. I have too many windows open. Oh dear, I totally lost the window. Because when I went to share, it just took over. Uh, I mean, it's also all right. There I we go, there we go, yeah. got it. Cancel, good, we're all good. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, then, um, while we wait for the other two to come back, um, Irene, do you want to start with Ine? And you should have Why this. not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Hey, okay. you're doing a great job, by the way, Ariana. It's really hard to facilitate all of this. So, great energy. Uh, well done. I'm excited to be here today. I do have a couple of sl uh, slides to share with you. So, I will try to click the right button. Uh, let me see. Uh, and then this. And voila. And what can you see? I think there's always a loading period. For the moment, we don't. Yeah, now we see it. It's coming. All right. And um, it's a PDF, so I don't think I can do presenter mode, but I, I will I will flick through it. But um, super excited to be with you today. I think we are the new kids on the block, especially when I sit next to Pascal. Uh, and even though commercially, Ina came to the market just under 10 months um, ago, 
uh, or 11 months ago, we have been in R&D for four years. And so um, we are new in the market. We're not so new in the femtech R&D scene, uh, but very happy to, to present to you what we do. Uh, we are in Berlin, just like Clue. And uh, we started just over four years ago with an obsession to go a little bit deeper uh, to the molecular level of the female body. Um, and that is the hormonal level. I personally believe that hormones define who we are as women uh, and uh, throughout our lives, whether we're interested in fertility or not. And I think uh, collecting a data point, if I was to choose, then hormonal data points would be the one thing I would want to know. Um, and I'm sure all the colleagues on the panel would want to know the same because you can do so much with it. So with that obsession, we started off by looking at what would be the easiest way or most convenient way to get to hormones themselves, but also in a way that is scientifically proven and can be manufactured also, right? So we don't stay for 10 years on R&D, but actually do go to the market and get closer to women. And um, we decided to use paper diagnostics and saliva, and that presented its challenges in itself. But um, we have managed to produce a medical device, a saliva test that measures progesterone. Um, with a one-step test. Uh, and here you can see just a visualization of our test. Oh, thanks, Oriana. That feels so good. <laughs> I could hear all the background noise. Um, and then here we are, the next slide. So here is an overview, a little bit of our system for those of you who don't know us and who haven't seen what we do. Um, we have um, three components to our offering. We have our saliva test, which is a uh, a hormonal test that we developed um, in-house in Berlin. Then we have a little colorimetric reader or a camera-based reader. Um, and during the panel, I'll go grab one because I'm actually in the office. It's my first day in the office after COVID. So super excited about that. Um, and it's very small. Um, and it does a constant monitoring of the development of the test, uh, image processing, and gives us a lot of data um, on how our test develops and what the hormonal levels of the woman are. And then, of course, we have a digital component to it, uh, which is the screen of all the results that we get from the hormonal test, uh, coupled with whatever details we have from the woman uh, herself. So her, her period dates, um, certain trackings of, of her symptoms, um, among other information about what stage of her cycle she's at. Uh, a little bit of how you you would use inne. By the way, inne comes from a beautiful German word called innehalten. I guess the, the Swiss colleagues that speak German know about this. So it's about taking a moment to pause uh, and look inside. And, um, and, and I find it really interesting to go through this specific slide whenever I talk about what we do, because it does show this repetition that you do every day. So, you know, you do four steps, but they are the same steps and they allow you to take a moment or two to sink in, in with your body and yourself and kind of like visualize, at least that's what I do, what your hormones are like and, and uh, how important they are for your overall health. So... Super easy, you unpack one of our strips, you collect for 30 seconds, you insert uh, the strip into our reader, and then you go about your day um, and your results come through your app, either via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, depending on where you're at. But we find you wherever you're at with connectivity. <laughs> um, we do take a lot of precaution about data. This is medical data. We are also a medical device um, company. And um, do not worry if someone intercepts and open up, opens up your reader and like tries to grab all the data that is stored in there. Would, they would not make any sense of it. Um, uh, you do need the combination of the three components to make sense of the hormonal data. So uh, super important for us also. Um, I think every every one of the colleagues here. And um, last but not least, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what has been driving us in the last four years. And now I started by saying we are the newest kids on the block in terms of commercial uh, time, but we have been a, a very, uh, a very, um, 
passionate team that had to work through a lot of failed scientific attempts before we got a successful scientific attempt. <laughs> and to do that, we had a guiding force of, of what we thought uh, made sense and why we stuck around, even in tough times. And that's because when we look at the female body and the reproductive body, um, we find that there is a lot of beauty, but there is also a lot of logic, despite this, you know, really... Um, uh, up and down and complex uh, curves that also uh, the professor showed us earlier, there is logic to that. There's a reason why things happen and they happen in a mode. Um, and we are here since day one and continued uh, th through the thick and thin because we want to use the best of technology, just not just old fashioned technology, but the best of technology and science available for the female body. Um, right now for fertility, but going forward for um, following women across their lives in whatever they need. Um, and we will always do that focusing on hormones themselves. So this is a little bit about what we do. I am Greek myself. So yes, I am the typical Greek who moved to Germany to uh, start a business. So there you are, a bit of a European cliche there. Uh, come from a business background and work over a decade in the healthcare industry, uh, mainly on uh, medical evacuations and repatriations. So I always talk about how I really enjoyed the adrenaline on, on um, evacuations and repatriations and also worked with doctors very closely. And now I'm in entrepreneurship, a lot of adrenaline and very much closely to the medical field. So extension um, of my professional life, I suppose. I can stop sharing now and then we can invite our other colleague on. No? Yeah. Yes. I, I think he's disappeared for the moment, but um, okay. we can just, uh, I don't know where he is quite, but we can hand it over to Pascal then and he can talk a little bit about Ava while we wait for Frederick to come back. Okay. Can I just say that I am a very big fan of uh, both uh, of all three companies that are on this panel. So both as a user uh, and as a colleague now. So big honor to be with you guys. Thanks for. Thanks so much, Irene. And uh, it's it's very interesting to see what happens on the saliva um, side. So um, we definitely should should talk sometimes. Um, Thanks, first of all, Oriana, very much for this event. It's really amazing. And uh, so many um, great speakers. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot and it's, uh, it's such an important topic. So um, thanks very much that, um, that we have been invited here. I actually wanted to show you some slides and show you kind of more about Ava. But Brigitte, uh, I guess, already did that half an hour ago or 20 minutes ago. Um, and she does that much better than I possibly could. So I'm not going to kind of um, repeat that, but maybe tell you a few things just um, on the background um, of kind of more how um, Ava evolved and, and how we started. And maybe starting, um, I'm one of the co-founders and I was CEO until the end of 2019 and then handed over to my co-founder, Leah, who is now CEO. So I'm in the board still and she's on maternity leave. So during these kind of 14 weeks of maternity leave in, um, in Switzerland, I, I kind of took over at interim um, um, as a CEO, but uh, she's doing that much better than I possibly could. So um, I'm just really here kind of replacing her. Um, but how did this all um, uh, start? Um, also, like, how does a how is a guy interested in, in, in starting a femtech company? So when I was in my like kind of teenager times or, or, or 20, I thought like you have unprotected intercourse and you will be immediately pregnant, right? So I was um, obviously very much, um, yeah, taking, making sure that, uh, that, 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 uh, that no mistake uh, could happen during that time. And then um, 15 years later, I was in my 30s um, trying to, to start the family and found out, well, actually, this is maybe not as easy as I thought when I was 20 to, um, to do that. So it was happy starting. It took longer than expected. And, um, and we found out that it's actually not so easy um, for a woman to know the, the fertile days. Um, of course, there is a calendar method, there is a temperature method, there are urine tests, but, 
but um, but all of these kind of approaches have their uh, downsides. So we started to do research and we, we thought that integrating physiological data, not just temperature, it's been known for decades that temperature correlates with progesterone, but we thought actually it could be very interesting to integrate additional physiological parameters as, um, as Brigitte uh, explained before. And um, we talked to various gynecologists. Many said like, oh, you know, I, I don't think this is needed. And Brigitte was one of them who was super, super open, very excited. Um, not sure whether Brigitte is still here, but a big shout out to her. And if you have projects, you should absolutely talk to her. She, she was really, really important for us to kind of get some first prototypes um, up. That was, uh, that's almost 10 years ago. So kind of unlike many European startups, we said like, let's not start in Europe, but really immediately go into the biggest market, which um, mm -hmm. is now becoming China, but um, at the time definitely um, was the US. Um, so we decided to, after a clinical um, study at the University Hospital of Zurich to launch the product in the US, which was definitely a good decision uh, for us. Um, still generating the majority of our revenues in the US. Um, and it's been, uh, yeah, the typical roller coaster, I guess. Um, it, as, uh, as Irene said, I mean, building a startup is just an up and down. It's, um, it's two steps forward, one step back, five steps forward, seven steps back. Uh, I think that's just kind of uh, in the nature of, of building a startup, but super exciting. We've been growing tremendously. We now have four offices, one in, in San Francisco. Here in Zurich, we do data science. Um, San Francisco is mostly marketing. Um, we do um, software development, development in Belgrade. Uh, we have a great team in Serbia. And then we do customer success in the Philippines. Uh, again, a great team. Um, so quite international also uh, already for um, still being um, uh, a startup company. So um, yeah, we're now focused on uh, fertility, supporting couples to um, to start a family, um, and uh, working on different uh, other things. Uh, Brigitte mentioned digital contraception is a is a super interesting one, um, but also during pregnancy up to menopause, basically uh, so much stuff that can be done uh, based um, on, on on data. And maybe just my last point, we are starting a Pearl Index study um, over the coming year. Um, so if anyone is interested in kind of finding out more about that, I'm just going to kind of put um, an email address. So if you're interested in supporting or finding out more about that, um, I will put that into the chat. And then with that, uh, yeah, hand over to Frederick. Super, thank you so much. Um, I can't share my screen now because we have five at the stage. You can take someone off if you want, Frederick. Would you like that? Yeah, would you like I think it would be great to just uh, have the slide in the background. That, uh, you okay. can take me off, just throw me out. Yeah, okay. Um, come back after though, <laughs> we're cool. Super, thanks. Let me see if it works. All right, looks perfect. Super, so I just wanted to maybe just introduce myself and then the company and the history. Um, so yeah, I'm co-founder, CEO of Circle Biomedical. Um, started working with my girl at that time. Okay, I said she didn't want to use the pill anymore because of the side effects uh, that she was experiencing. I think me, as many other men, weren't very aware, um, never exposed. But it didn't take long before I realized I wouldn't use hormonal contraception. Um, a lot of my friends were talking about the same things. Um, and I got more and more curious once you start you know, diving into what are the alternatives, how little innovation has there been in this space uh, for decades, more than 60 years um, at this point. Then um, I yeah, met a researcher at a Danish hospital who interviewed more than 1,000 women about contraceptive needs who confirmed that a bigger scale, there is this shift in the market away from hormonal contraception. There's a lot of frustration about the lack of alternatives, and especially the mental side effects that are shaping the market. Um, I was looking for something potentially impactful to work on, and I thought contraception is perfect. Um, 
And coming from a business innovation background, my approach is really go out, talk to users, understand how would the ideal contraceptive look like, and then try to find a technology that could unlock that kind of new product. Um, so I spent around two years talking to different researchers until I was introduced to the scientific co-founder of the company, Thomas Kocher, um, a researcher in Stockholm um, who started working on mucus engineering at MIT, then established his research group in Stockholm. Um, and meeting him, that's when was really this kind of perfect match between the technology um, and the user need to create a, what we think is a breakthrough in contraception. Um, so I think we can all agree there is a huge need. Um, and if we just look at what are the alternatives out there, let me just see if I can change. Yeah. So if we look at what are the alternatives, you don't want to use hormonal contraception, which is really uh, a big need. Um, you have condoms, very effective when used correctly, but in actual use, quite low because of lack of acceptability, compliance is a male controlled method, copper IUD, super effective, but also causes uh, inflammation, irritation, um, pain, um, low overall adoption. There's the fertility awareness methods um, that are, you know, don't cause any side effects, but can have low efficacy. There's a requirement of abstinence if you don't use another contraceptive and there's like cycle variations. Spermicides, uh, not very effective, typically cause irritation. And what kind of all these fundamental technologies have in common is they're around 100 years old. Um, so the thinking was really, if we want to create a breakthrough in contraception, we have to think of something completely new, a completely new approach to contraception, really to unlock a new value proposition. Um, so our idea is um, mucus engineering um, and leveraging a barrier that already exists, which is the cervical mucus. So cervical mucus is interesting that it's um, a barrier um, and throughout the menstrual cycle, it really changes. So for most of the time, uh, it doesn't allow any sperm to go through. It's only on and around ovulation. It loosens up, become more watery. The sperm cells can go through. Um, so what we are doing is we are modifying that, bringing it back to its kind of naturally impenetrable state. The way we do that is by uh, a small biopolymer. So it's a gel, you apply it vaginally. That uh, biopolymer interacts with the mucus. It just changes its microstructure, going back to that naturally impenetrable state. Um, and that's really the fundamental idea that we just use a barrier that's already there. It's already a very strong barrier. And just by modifying it slightly, uh, we bring it back to that phase where it's impossible to penetrate. And we think there are really three things that are unique to contraception that we're addressing with this approach. One is that uh, side effects are really unacceptable when it comes to contraception. Um, as a user, you're young, healthy, um, and you shouldn't be you know, exposed to the side effects that you see, for instance, with hormonal contraception. Uh, what we're doing is just a um, topical treatment of that mucus is not systemic, um, really designed to minimize the risk of any side effect occurring. The second aspect is it needs to be very convenient, uh, seamless, uh, unnoticeable, uh, it's, you know, it's an intimate moment. The user experience is completely essential. And that's what we can provide with this kind of approach. Something that you don't know is there. We're targeting that it works within a minute for several hours, giving you freedom. It's not like the pill where you have to take it every day at the same time to stay protected. It's really working for you. And then finally, it's also very much about uh, efficacy and trust. Uh, you need something that's much more effective than many of the non-hormonal alternatives today. So the state of development we are at is we are preclinical. So we're doing experiments in large animals. Um, and what we have demonstrated so far is 100% efficacy in these large animals. Um, we've compared to um, spermicides um, that are around 80% effective in, uh, in humans. We see the same results in these large animals. So it really points towards that we have a new mechanism of action. It's significantly more effective than traditional spermicides. Um, and hopefully it can be a yeah, new solution um, that can be helpful to a lot of uh, users. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Frederick, for presenting. Um, I think if Pascal comes back on, we can start the discussion, the round table. Yeah, he's here, he's in the queue. 
Okay. Um, so I know not all of you, but um, most of you, you collect a, a lot of data, which you, you don't share, but I think we're all interested in sort of to hear about the collaboration you have with researchers. Um, so for example, I know that Clue um, uh, shares a lot of data with researchers. You, there's studies I've read about which look at whether psychosis symptoms change throughout the cycle, whether there's a potential association between menstrual cycle symptoms and breast cancer, whether air pollution affects the menstrual cycle. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that process, about sharing data with researchers, why Clue decided to share data with researchers, and actually whether that's impacted any of the decisions you've made as a company, the the, the conclusions of these studies. Yeah, Sure, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, I think one of the things that I said is that women's health and people with cycles health is under-researched, it's underfunded, right? So when you look at funding um, from like federal institutions, when you think about, you know, who funded the first experiments about IVF or the birth control pill, those were all privately funded, right? So they were not originally funded by governments and, and, and uh, institutions such as those. So what, you know, I think what uh, Ida Ten really saw was that there was a need for more. And so as we had this, this rich database, we didn't want to, you know, sell the data because we want our users to trust us and we don't want to sell it to people who would use it for profit. So we decided uh, as a company that we wanted to actually take that data and help promote the field of women's health and people with periods. And so we only work with researchers who are really trying to, to drive the information that we don't know. And so in the past, we've worked with a lot of people who've been interested in cycles and large database. And so what we're doing now is we're working a little bit more with physician scientists. And so we're trying to have more scientists who have perhaps a clinical uh, translational outcome that might change clinical practice. And so I think that's kind of where we are in, in the horizon. I think that's where we're going. And that's really exciting to me as a physician scientist, because before I came to Clu, I was working in femtech as a researcher. And it took me, 50, it took me two years to recruit 52 uh, girls, adolescent girls, to a study. And that's, that's typical, because a lot of people don't know about studies. They don't know how to access the studies. A lot of times when you see studies, they're very homogeneous. You have like you know, white males, right? And so we're trying to change that dynamic and so that we want people to know about research studies. We want them to know that they should participate and that they should feel comfortable that we would only work with researchers who are um, IRB approved, so Institutional Review Board approved, and they have a, a good sound scientific plan and that we know exactly what they're going to do with that data. Clue, if I'm not mistaken, is starting to to do some clinical research studies themselves, right? That that's part of your job as chief medical officer, improving the clinical studies that you're partnering with. Is that is that? Yeah. So, so trying to also uh, make the physician scientist community aware is is my job, and I do a lot of outreach to um, uh, healthcare providers to let them know that we're a resource for them. Um, but also, you know, we do, we're starting to, we actually had an abstract accepted at Society for Reproductive Investigation, which is an international society. And I encourage all the students who are listening to, you know, if you have an idea for a project, approach a professor and, and do a project because anyone can, and can submit an abstract and it goes through peer review. And we're going to be talking about the impact of, of COVID on, on people's access to contraception. And so that's really exciting because that's information that people want to know. And obviously in the U.S., there's been a lot of um, uh, financial uh, strain because of the pandemic. I, yeah, I think it's actually all the studies that have come out uh, looking at the impact of COVID on menstrual cycles or, or contraception has been really fascinating. I know, um, Pascal, that there was articles written that Ava could help um, detect COVID symptoms. No? Is that is that incorrect that you were doing a partnership regarding that, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a year ago when that all started. Um, I think it was end of February or so, 2020, when um, when we everybody started to talk about COVID. We had a lot of internal discussion, like kind of how could we contribute, and and we were convinced that um, physiological data measured over time could could play a, a role in uh, in diagnosis. Um, and um, so we talked to many researchers during that time and uh, and actually started a few projects. 
one in Liechtenstein um, and then a much bigger one in uh, in Amsterdam in Holland um, also uh, collaborated with uh, a, a few US uh, researchers and um, started to uh, to work on that and in the meantime we have really figured out that um, with an algo um, driven by physiological parameters you can diagnose a COVID a few days before symptom onset um, and uh, and obviously that that is uh, is, is is super interesting um, COVID will not be obviously um, or COVID-19 will obviously not be in kind of the end of infections and stuff so this is uh, something that will probably occupy us for the next hundred years as much as it has uh, over the last hundred years so we're very excited about uh, possibilities uh, on that side still working on it uh, some studies still going on um, and uh, yeah looking what we can do but in general i mean we're not going to go away from uh, women's health um, so we definitely want to keep focusing on uh, that was kind of a side project for us uh, over the last year and um, just by the fact that you know i think i think there is so much more we can do in women's health i think we're at the very very beginning um and just maybe a few examples i mean we see a lot of our customers continuing wearing um the bracelet um once they are uh, pregnant um, first of all, I mean, we see pregnancy basically before a urine, like a conventional pregnancy test could see it, which is not a huge surprise if you think about it, that your uh, body behaves differently. Um, but then, I mean, there is so much stuff. I mean, you can recognize uh, complications, preeclampsia, stuff like that, which is a huge issue still um, during pregnancy. Um, you can uh, see the onset of labor a few weeks before and, and a lot of exciting stuff where we're just kind of starting to get more and more insights. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, also this panel about the different approaches. And uh, I think there is so much room to, to, to improve the status quo. Okay, since you since you brought that up about um, the future of women's health and where the femtech space is expanding, I don't know if uh, either you, Irene, or Frederick want to want to jump in, and then all of you get your take on where you see um, the field headed. Um, I'd imagine you're all most excited about the field of contraception and fertility, but maybe you could talk a little bit about why everything's been so slow to change, and maybe why you think it's starting to change now. That's a lot of questions in one, Noriana. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely excited on contraception. And I think I wrote in our private chat to uh, Pascal, I think this is going to be the year of Pearl Index. I think everyone is doing a Pearl Index study, which is great, actually great for, for everyone, great for the industry. Um, I, I believe that uh, female health is underfunded, under-researched. Uh, it actually makes me angry every time I think about it. And yet there's so much technology out there that if we could just deploy it onto the female body, we can make miracles. I believe that um, the future of femtech will be in consolidation. Uh, and I mean that on the business side. Uh, I think that customers or users or women um, want more and more to have one trusted partner they go to for multiple things. I believe that on our side, we as entrepreneurs have created innovation that is perhaps segmented. And I am pretty sure that in the next few years, there will be consolidation of, with either partnerships of some of us on this panel, perhaps, or, or buyouts. Um, and I think that can benefit women in the longer term. Uh, so that's on the business side what I think will happen. Uh, and then on the female health side, I believe we will be moving outside contraception and fertility onto more uh, uh, following more of following a female across her life. So hormonal imbalances or hormonal conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, uh, but also like using your cycle to optimize your life. So uh, athletics, nutrition, depression, um, uh, hormonal health as a perhaps um, uh, preventative health um, uh, 
uh, aid, like, um, I don't know, predicting breast cancer. So, you know, estradiol and progesterone can be great indicators of that. And let's not forget menopause and perimenopause. I do believe, uh, at least for us in the panel, we are startups, commercials, right? Not just researchers. The reason why we have been focusing on fertility, and I believe the reason why we're all also focusing on contraception is because these two life stages of a woman's life are very well understood in terms of market too. Therefore, money has flown into it, much less than other fields, much less than fintech for sure. Um, but people understand, investors can you know, uh, um, quantify it and therefore they invest in it. I think all the other parameters are not well understood, not well defined. And it is our job as startups that are already in the field to bring light to that and say, we are not just birthing machines. Um, I say that and I've just delivered a few weeks ago, so we definitely can do that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we are human beings that need a lot more money into uh, understanding our own bodies and having medication adapted to us and and having our lives made easier through using the right technology. Frederick, do you agree? 100%. Um, I think it's clear that um, women's health tech has been an area that's been neglected, um, underfunded, um, and Ariane, you asked me um, whether it's a cultural or it's a market problem. Um, I think at its root is probably a cultural problem, um, but today it's also very much a market problem that it's simply underfunded. Um, but yeah, so that's one aspect of it. I think also what we're seeing, uh, what we're experiencing is that's a lot of investor interest that's coming in. Um, we see uh, more females getting involved in venture capital. I think that's actually something that's going to be very important uh, as we move forward. I think the appetite for investing in this area is only growing. I think we're at the very early stage. I think we're also seeing a transition going from in the beginning, it was very software and app based to now hardware and biology, uh, similar to the space we are in. Um, yeah, and I think it's also about um, demand uh, from the user side um, really highlighting that there is a need uh, for uh, better products in, in women's health yeah maybe i can uh, say a few words i mean i i agree with much what has been said i mean in terms of looking back uh, i remember really well it was probably 2013 or 14 or so when Ida and Hans, the two co-founders of Clue, they, they came up to us and said like, hey, we're thinking about, you know, naming this space where we are all working on. We, we could name that Femtech and what do you think about that and stuff? And we thought it's a great idea. And, and I mean, now it's the, the title of, um, of, of an event and, um, and, 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 and many people know this. Um, this uh, this work so a lot has happened um, I agree Frederick uh, I think uh, female VCs are important uh, we don't have to explain that much that this is a, a big market anymore uh, some years ago this was still tough when um, when it was completely male dominated it was very much uh, a big frustration um, but there is still a long, long way to go. I think we are, even if it's improving, I mean, we're, it's still frustrating that, uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers, even how much is invested into, into women's health, I mean, it's, it's maybe a percent of, 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 of all, right, in, 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 in medtech and, and biotech. So it's, it's still, um, there is still a long way to go. In terms of, I mean, Irene, what you said about the, the, the consolidation and stuff, I agree. I think there will be consolidation. And now with the whole SPAC, what happens in the US with the SPACs and stuff, there is a lot of uh, interesting development uh, going on. But at the same time, you know, if you look at the big corporates, uh, the, the Mercs and the Bayers uh, of, the, of the world. Um, I think they do many super cool things, but at the same time, you know, as a humble startup um, can sometimes be so much faster and, 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 and unconventional because they don't have to go through 200 whatever milestones to make something happen. So if, if people in the audience here are thinking about something, I mean, obviously, you will never be able to compete with the big pharma and the, the big medtech companies um, on, on a financial and resource side. But, 
but very often you're really surprised how much you can still as a, as a small team make uh, make a difference and and i think i guess uh, all our companies are to a, to a certain degree proof that that this is really working so so don't be afraid really to start and just call up brigitte uh, even if she doesn't have time try and uh, and and I guess also we in the panel. I mean, just approach us if if you have ideas. And at least I am super happy to to kind of support. And maybe the last point in terms of contraception. I agree, it's pretty well understood. But still, I think there is so much there is so much room to to improve that. I'm I'm actually super happy about the the Clue product that was. Um, uh, now also FDA approved. I think that can make a huge difference if you think about also developing countries where maybe people don't have access to to advanced stuff, um, but everybody has a smartphone. and And think about the impact Clue could have in these in these countries, which is just amazing. And obviously not just in developing countries, um, also in, um, in 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 the developed world. So I think there is still so much stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, mucus engineering, saliva, and, and and hopefully Ava playing a role here. And I think there is room for for a lot of different solutions. I think there is no one size fits all. I think uh, different life stages, um, a different um, solution can be right. And I think one last point, it will be really the last one now, is kind of um, I think men um, also play an important role. I mean, contraception should definitely not just be a, a, a woman's topic. Um, there is uh, also a lot of responsibility to take an over by men. And I, we didn't actually talk about, you know, Clue's exciting news. It's on the horizon. We're very excited about it. It's not on the market yet, but we hope in 2022 to be on the market. And so, yeah, I think I love what you said, Pascal, about there's not one size that fits all. And I think a lot of people have different needs, different lifestyles, and, you know, adherence to a regimen is the most effective contraception right? And so if you can't take a pill every day, it's not ever going to work for you. If you don't like how an IUD makes you feel, it's not ever going to work for you. But really establishing for patients, what's the best thing for them? And I think the one thing that the pandemic has given us that is a good thing is that we will never go back to the old way. I remember trying to do telehealth, um, you know, back in 2000 like 12 and like, nope, everyone's like, that's crazy. Everyone can just go into the hospital. It's never going to work. And now look, telehealth has saved us, right? And so mHealth, which is what sort of the medical equivalent equivalent of FemTech is, is an mHealth app. That's never going away. It's now, you know, ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs has recognized that mHealth is, is, is really essential to managing um, during this pandemic. And I think the convenience well, the patients will never go back to, well, I have to go into the hospital to get, you know, my uh, my evaluation or I have to go in. Now, you know, companies uh, like that are doing blood spot tests where you can mail in your test to find out, you know, what your AMH is, what your estradiol is, what your FSH. I think that's brilliant because it takes out the really the high costs that were always associated with REI and reproductive endocrinology and, and IVF. And that makes it convenient for the person to really participate, not only in their care, but to understand more about their cycles. And I think, you know, that's what we want it through. That's what we lead with is understanding how your cycle works, understanding when you see changes, what happens, you know, as a result of those changes. And I think what something Irene said is that, you know, the hormonal um, trajectory that we have in our lives changes and our needs change. And people may not realize that they're having symptoms that are connected to that change, to that evolution, and that they don't have to suffer in silence. So we try to normalize things at Clue so that we normalize the period, we normalize going through your perimenstrual or perimenopausal time, we normalize going through puberty so that more people are talking about, there's less stigma, and hopefully that will generate um, interest in the research and interest into the funding. Well, <laughs> All of your answers were incredibly fascinating. I think you had all a, a similar take, but very, very different perspectives on it. Um, actually, you were talking about um, doctors and how all of that has changed um, since COVID and all that. And I know that you all collaborate with doctors, although in different ways. And I was wondering if you could all briefly touch upon 
the ways that you collaborate with doctors, whether your goal is to give consumers, give patients all the tools they need themselves to be able to handle the contraceptive and fertility experience a bit better, or whether you see it really as an active back and forth with doctors. Um, I don't know who wants to start. I can give a little bit of our perspective. Um, so part of what we really believe in is uh, also seeing the change that's happened over the past few years with telemedicine um, and just removing that friction and the barrier of accessing contraception. So when we think about our product and we think like, it'll be launched in, let's say, four or five years into the future, um, we think this is going to be digital and it's going to be a product that you access through some kind of telemedicine uh, platform. So if it's Nurex, uh, the Pill Club, or him, sir, and so on. Um, that's really, I think, the future. Um, how we work with doctors at the moment is really at um, key opinion leaders, uh, understanding their take, uh, taking in their perspectives uh, in the development, uh, making sure that we develop the right kind of products. Um, if I may just jump on that, because I, I think what Frederick mentioned is super interesting. So the way I see all of us on the panel is that, um, and tell me if you all agree, uh, we do build products for women, so therefore for users. And so when we look at, at how we think of got of making our products accessible, we think similarly to Frederick, you know, online platforms where people can find us online, women can read about us, um, use us. That's why Clue has an, an amazing encyclopedia as well. So we're thinking online as the place where our women find us and where they consume information and perhaps buy us. I think the harsh reality of it though is for our products to be built and validated, we need to go, a, a lot of us at least, um, through regulatory approval. And in that, uh, that happens very much not online <laughs> and very much paper-based. So we all, I think, have this um, split personality of building for an online persona and and creating you know a, an online um, community where we can add value but then our products themselves uh, require a lot of face-to-face -face regulatory preparation and their doctors play a huge part um, the other element so so i think that's the harsh reality of any femtech startup that has to go through regulation so if anyone in the in the audience wants to start a startup that needs regulatory be prepared for leaving in the future but also in the past it is a lot of fun um, and then i think the the next part that comes to my mind in terms of doctors is that they have played a great role in when they have the time uh, to take the time and explain our options. So I think what Lena said earlier about not one size fits all, look, we are all here to put options on the table and there's only very few of us doing it. So we need more options on the table. And I think once there's too many options, you do need doctors to try and help you navigate because they know also your medical history and they can ask the right questions. So I think they play a huge part in it. I would just love that we have more gynecologist like uh, the amazing professor who opened our panel who can think both online but also offline um, and can help us uh, boost innovation rather than slow us down that's the beauty of this of this um, so again uh, congratulations on this success of a summit because i think that this is a conversation that needs to be had at medical schools around the world because I think you know, learning pharmacology is really important. Learning anatomy, extremely important, but really not uh, letting technology sort of be this um, stepchild that we don't participate in. And I've heard from colleagues that uh, they feel as though sometimes that uh, uh, tech in general sidesteps the physician. And it really can't because again, at the end of the day, we're the ones who are trained to interpret for the, the, the patient. And, and yes, the patient can get information online and yes, who has a wonderful resource, but sometimes you need a more personalized um, sort of intervention with your physician. And I think that really Femtech is a way to bridge the gap that exists now because there is an information gap that exists between the physician and the patient. And, also, your physician, I don't know how it is maybe in Switzerland, but in the U.S., you get maybe 15 or 20 minutes with a physician, maybe once a year. And so you really have to be cognizant of everything, of all your concerns and know your history and communicate that in 15 to 20 minutes. And that's, that's not feasible. 
So really being sort of like the keeper, the record keeper, we call it the historian of your, of your medical record of understanding how your body works is really falls on, on the shoulders of the patient. And so that's why having tools like who understanding, you know, when your first your period came and how, how often your cycles come, how long your period is, you know, the quantity of your period, all of those things are very key and very important to communicate to your gynecologist or to your primary care doctor. You know, maybe just to make a bit a counterpoint here, I, I, I mean, I, I hear you that, I mean, consumerization of healthcare will be important and, and the online distribution and, and all of that. And, and, and that kind of, we as patients need to take responsibility and, and stuff. I fully agree with, with all of that. But, but then we need to also consider, I mean, here in this group, probably most people are very well educated. They understand biology. They know how to kind of understand the product. But the ugly truth is really, uh, I think you can sell any product. Just take a, just take an influencer, right? Go on TikTok, um, go on Insta. You have the right influencer and you will sell 10,000s of your product, right? Of your medical product. And most people have no clue about, you know, what is the science behind it and this and that. And so, frankly, I think gynecologists also in the future will play a key role um, in many of the areas that we're talking about. And, and I think it's right that, that they play a key role, whether it's going to be online in the future or whether you still have to go to an office, I don't know, um, hopefully more and more online or, or uh, convenient. Um, but I really feel they have a very, very important role to play. And I think their role will change, right? It's not going to be that like in the past, they're going to be, you know, the one and only. I mean, people will Google before and stuff, maybe come with opinions. But I think to have kind of a person who is really well educated, who cares about the science and, and not just about marketing, um, I think will be will remain being uh, as important as it was in the past. If I may add just on that, uh, Pascal, fully agree. I don't think any of us thinks that we don't need doctors, of course. And I think none of us is a marketer in here, right? At least uh, looking at the four of us. <laughs> but, um, but I think what is definitely important then is that uh, gynecologists do have as part of their education, uh, if they don't have the time with a woman, with a patient, they have as part of their education to think outside the box and to actually see what fits and what the woman wants. Otherwise, we're going to be recreating, you know, or recreating this whole thing of like the pill is the solution to all. Perhaps the pill gets you know, um, changed with another product, but we want to avoid that. And we want to change the conversation a little bit towards the woman. And I'm sure that's what you meant too, right? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's the frustration for many yeah. tech startups, right? I mean, you the doctors, I mean, they want to see peer review journals, right? And many of them, right? And we all know, I mean, until you have a peer review journal, until you have your prototype, until you have the... the uh, you know, a, a clinical study that is big enough, that, that is uh, statistically strong and all of that. I mean, that takes years and years. I mean, sometimes even a decade. Yeah. And, and obviously, as a startup, that's a tough one, right? So, so I do think kind of the general kind of digital health playbook, you start with B2C, you make sure you get kind of product market fit, you invest into clinical research, and, and then maybe as time goes on, kind of shift more and more into B2B channels, I think is probably right from a startup view. But, but still, I just also like, yeah, I just find it frustrating sometimes also that, you know, with a good marketing, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking a lot to my kids, right? That the stuff they see on Insta or on TikTok or whatever platform they are is not necessarily always, you know, from a medical perspective or from whatever perspective, the, the right one. And, and I think, again, we're educated. I guess we, we all know that, but, but not everybody is, is there. I think you make an interesting point about fads and trends, um, sometimes in the, the medical community. And I can remember some sort of a little bit off topic is that 
when I was a resident, there was this, this like huge like trend to have these like uh, 3D ultrasounds and so that people could have like a picture of the baby before they were born. And we were all against it as a medical community. It was unnecessary. We thought it was an unnecessary heat that was put onto the fetus. And we had no way of stopping it because it was so popular. And then eventually it just faded out. It just faded out. It's not something that people became, I think, um, you know, addicted to. They didn't keep staffing these, or they didn't keep going to these places. So the, the places, they, they basically went out of business because they didn't contribute anything in the long run. And so sometimes I think that's the why we need evidence-based uh, medicine. Although it does take a long time, although it is very frustrating, I can imagine for, for people who are investing their life, their money and, and their time into a startup, it is it is so important because that's how we become part of the medical community instead of being sort of like the sideline. And I think for a very long time, technology has been sidelined in medicine. And now because of the pandemic, we can no longer, we can't, we can't do that anymore. We, there's no going back. And so again, I think those things that are not evidence-based that don't add value really, you know, it was cute to have this you know, 3D ultrasound picture of your baby on, 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 we do baby showers in the US. So, you know, but it didn't add value, it didn't help. Um, and I think eventually it just fizzled. What we need is really open-minded gynecologists and doctors, and hopefully there are some in the, in the audience. And, and really, I mean, I think exactly be open-minded, uh, look at technology, don't just kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I think the status quo needs to remain. And and I think the younger ones are, are very open to that. And there are Brigitte's and stuff all over the world. So so I think they are. Um, but it's really kind of building it together. I think that's the magic formula. Yeah, I think also, though, um, there wasn't necessarily a will to, I mean, you all spoke about the need for there to be evidence-based, but there wasn't necessarily the drive to collect that information, right? There was a lack of research. I mean, we're taught in medical school, but um, I think, I mean, that's what shocked me. That's what made me do the, the summit in the first place is that we were finding out about all these conditions, um, but there was a lack of, of treatment options or diagnostic options, um, all sorts of those problems. But um, so I'd actually be interested, um, I think you all answered it in part, but um, patients themselves, you don't have, have trouble um, people gravitate towards your products that you think that patients themselves understand the need for this innovation or do they, or or is there a lack of education around gynecological syndromes and um, you think that that's also a barrier that needs to be surmounted that women themselves don't necessarily have the information um, i know that clue for example has an encyclopedia so i imagine that that's a part of your project to to give the information out there but yeah i wouldn't be able to dare to answer this question uh, but i would we do live in a bubble and I think no matter, you know, um, at least our femtech bubble, um, I, I do refer to them as women rather than patients. And I do believe that there is a huge lack of education, of basic education of our menstrual cycles still going on in Europe, big parts of it. So <clears throat> let alone conditions. Uh, that perhaps we don't know that is happening, that we think we just have a heavy period and it ends up be being PCOS or endometriosis. So we're really far from being able to say education, basic education is available to everyone. That's why I think the encyclopedia that Clue put up is super important um, and, and other uh, apps have done similar uh, initiatives. But I wouldn't dare to say that, you know, um, women seek out uh, help. I think they if anything they talk with themselves um i don't think we have a lot of resources to meet them online still i think we're still limited and yet there's so much happening like great content is being created every week i see it i live in that bubble of course whenever something is new i see it um i just think we the more we get digitized the the more we can spread uh, this good news. And I think the collaboration between femtech startups will also help, uh, you know, boost that um, content and help more people gravitate towards knowing what they might not know, uh, because there's a lot of women who don't know what they don't know right now, if you know what I'm saying. I I'd love to hear what, yeah. I just... Yeah. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> Frederick, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> okay, then um, just maybe one comment, uh, just one reflection is um, focusing on homo contraception that we experience.
uh, hormonal contraception has been, you know, it's a revolution. It's um, the root of much of the gender equality that we see today uh, couldn't have happened without hormonal contraception. Um, and I think there's a challenge when you talk to doctors that they will not maybe go out and talk very badly about hormonal contraception because what is the alternative? What are they going to recommend as an alternative as it is today? Uh, that's, I think, the opinion of many doctors. So if there is not a better alternative, um, they will not highlight maybe all of the disadvantages of hormonal contraception. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess with two points, you know, so a lot of people still don't know a lot about their reproductive health. Um, and that's fair said. And it's because, especially in the U.S., I'm not sure, in the, in the European school systems, but in the U.S., there's no comprehensive sexual health, you know. And so unless you have a resource um, that is uh, maybe from your family, your friends, um, a lot of people go through their entire lives not knowing how their body works. And that's a, that's a crime. That's a crime, right? And I think one of the ways that KU really improves that is we take things that which seem complex and make it uh, available to the everyday person. And I think that that helps um, empower people so that they can have more in-depth conversations with their physicians, right? And so one of the things that people might want to say to their physician is that I, I really am not happy using the pill or I'm really not happy. Now, I've I've loved the pill. I've used the pill myself. I've, I've had a Mirena. I love that too. But not everybody is happy with that. And sometimes, uh, you know, like Frederick said, physicians are very reluctant because we've grown up with the pill. We, we, this is what we know to be, you know, very reliable and effective. But there, again, it's not a one uh, solution for every single person. And I think being able to direct patients, um, when mm -hmm. instruct them about their cycle and let them know how their cycle works, and then give them alternatives that will work for their lifestyle to help them control their reproduction. And I can't tell you how many patients that I used to see as a reproductive endocrinologist who would come to me, they couldn't describe their menstrual cycles, one, because they were on the pill for a very long time. And so they really didn't remember menarche. They really didn't remember how their cycles were. And so they couldn't really describe it. And here they are now with infertility. So it's not clear if they had an issue at the onset of menarche that was just, you know, masked by the pill or not. And so really, I think that some people would maybe benefit from understanding their cycle um, and understand having a reproductive life plan, because that's something we haven't talked about, right, is that a lot of patients may not realize that they should really think about, I think Pascal said in his 20s, he was thought you have one unprotected sex incident and that's it, you're going to get pregnant. And, and that's not exactly how it works, right? And so they don't have a reproductive life plan. They don't understand that, yes, it's easier to get pregnant as you're younger and as you get into your 30s, it's harder. And as you get into your 40s, it's almost, you know, impossible with your own egg. And so, you know, and what is menopause, you know, right? And a lot of people have these, these ideas about what is menopause? Oh, you become a man when you, when you go through menopause. I hear that a lot from patients. And so really kind of debunking these myths and, and demystifying reproductive health and, and, and normalizing it and so that people can really understand their cycles and have a conversation and do what's called shared decision making with their physician. So their physician is not telling them, oh, yes, here's this prescription. We don't write prescriptions anymore, but it's not, I think in Germany, there's still paper. Uh, but in the U.S., they're electronic. They go to your pharmacy. You go pick it up usually. Or now it can be mailed to you. you know? So, um, you know, but we don't we don't just do that anymore. Now we need to say, and here are the risks. Here are the benefits. Here are the pros and here are the cons. And what is it that you think would work for you? We've, we hopefully are shedding the patriarchy. When it comes uh, to medicine, we're and we're shedding that uh, that 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 thought that we know best. We don't know best because we we have to really rely on the patient to be compliant. And we know that despite having all of the hormonal options that we have on the market in the United States, the unintended pregnancy rate is forty five percent, and in some ethnic groups, is it's, it's over sixty percent. And it's not much better in Europe that there's still a lot of unintended pregnancies. And so, and who sh who who bears that burden? It's usually the person with the cycle, right? So in the U.S., you'd have to pay for daycare usually as the woman. You have to pay for child care. You have to pay for, you know, breastfeeding, maybe equipment, formula. So it really is important for empowering women to have reliable contraception that works for their lifestyle and, and, and come into a decision with their physician.
just make a point because I feel like we've been talking against doctors and that's has not been my intention at all. I came to know about natural contraception from an amazing gynecologist. Like it was a gynecologist that told me one that my lifestyle, my age, um, my obsession with uh, being very regular with anything I do, right? So she knew that it would suit me and she knew all the hormonal issues that I had being on hormonal contraception. So hats off to all the doctors out there. It's just that we need more that can come with tech. That was my intention initially. Yeah, I think the key- Didn't take any, didn't take any offense by that at all. Yeah, I think you highlighted the key being patient-centric, and that's what it's really all about. And I fully understand, uh, agree with the need of education, and uh, I really think, uh, in general, it's uh, it's it's a hugely important topic. And Clue does a great job um, in terms of uh, yeah building contents, but also making them very inclusive. Um, so I, I I really have huge respect uh, for all that work. Um, in terms of the user needs, um, I think they are actually very clear. So even if you don't understand anything about your body, I think the user needs are very clear. So if you're trying to have a baby and it doesn't work, this quickly becomes the biggest thing in your life, basically driving your entire life. Um, the same in terms of pregnancy complications. I mean, if you have a complication, um, be it preeclampsia or gestational diabetes or whatever, I think it also quickly becomes the biggest uh, thing in, the, in, in your life as a woman. And even in contraception, I would say. I mean, my um, partner, she used to have a lot of pain around IUDs, as, as great as IUDs are. Um, side effects of, 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 of uh, hormone contraception, we've discussed them. Um, on the male side, I mean, condoms, I mean, they have killed many romantic situations in my own life. <laughs> I did a vasectomy uh, some time ago also. I mean, something that you need to go to hospital and stuff. I mean, it's uh, obviously much easier for uh, for the males to do that than, than for, a mim uh, for a woman. Uh, but, but, but still, I mean, I think there is a huge potential for innovation also in contraception, and most people realize that. So... Um, I think, yeah, there is a need for education, but the user needs are pretty clear. Um, well, thank you all for, for those insights. I think now I'm going to turn it over to some questions from the audience, if that's all right with all of you. Um, okay, so one of our first questions is about that there's increasing self access to self-measurements of cycles and hormones, right, with Ava, with Clue, um, with NA, um, and whether wondering what your approach is to reconciling what maybe new parameters of normality will come to light, because um, more and more people are getting to measure, maybe we'll have a, a different data set than what we've always based the assumption off of before, and how you reconcile that with your product going forward. Um, yeah. Uh, Pascal, do you want to start? I don't know if you have an answer or... Yeah, no, I mean, I fully agree. I think this will involve science big time. Uh, I think we'll realize that probably many women have much uh, less regular cycles than, than was thought. Um, I think many of the, the, the things we, we thought for granted um, over the last decades will be challenged over the coming decades. Um, so, um, so I do think that this will um, that this will strongly influence uh, kind of uh, medical practice and uh, and state of the art. Um, just maybe one small example. I mean, at the beginning when we started at Deva and we talked to gynecologists, they often said like, "Yes, I mean, it's true that temperature correlates with progesterone, but we are interested in." In, uh, in body basal temperature, right? Um, so measured um, orally or vaginally. Um, and we are not really interested in temperature measured at the wrist as we do it uh, in our case. And um, now after uh, years and years of science, we could actually are investing into that. We could actually show that if you measure temperature throughout the night, so if you have big data sets, um, you can actually um, detect the increase in progesterone better than if you just have a daily, uh, like a, a measurement in the morning, which is 
then again dependent on uh, your circadian rhythm and uh, and whether um, how well you slept and all of that stuff so so i think that's we're just at the very edge trying to better and better understand that and this will have a huge impact um, over over the coming decade I'm, I'm i'm convinced of that totally agree i on our side um i actually believe that's how we can make a dent in the universe um by being able to uh send some light in the under researched areas um by using real actual data that uh, doesn't have you know doesn't need to go through uh, uh proper research um etc and and that gives us you know the real use parameters so we not going to use the product all the time or we'll use it erroneously so you get really valuable data we on our side uh, are planning for those uh, insights are not we're not at the stage yet uh, i believe collaborations would be super interesting and i do think that the um, uh, the new technologies that are available in data science uh, itself will give us insights into things that we never thought before so being able to throw a data set into a machine learning um, uh, model and getting an indication out of it that maybe then you can try and um, uh, and verify will will be happening more and more. We have to be extremely transparent with our women about this. We need to get explicit um, approval. I don't. I have not come round to a user so far that would not be happy to share their insights or their data for medical purposes without their name tag. Um, actually, right now, when a woman uses in it to fall pregnant, they do f f uh, manage to get pregnant. We ask them to enroll in a specific study where we measure progesterone levels throughout the pregnancy. And especially on their first trimester, is super interesting because it can be uh, an indication, uh, an early indication of miscarriage. And I don't think we've had, unless I'm wrong, uh, my colleagues can wave at me, but we haven't had anyone not agreeing to do it. So I think there's a lot of interest uh, from women themselves, I dare to say or suggest. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, trying to think. It's like, you know, there's so many untackled things in infertility. And, you know, we always go to IVF as the end result, right? And that's where you end up if everything else doesn't work. And to me, as a, as a physician scientist, that's just not enough. Right now, that's a Band-Aid. And I think what big data sets can really do is not only perhaps recognize changes that might occur in someone before they have actually irregular cycles, right? So is that you, you start to maybe see things um, that are, that, that sort of, preempt the person, hey, something is wrong here. And and that can maybe give us insights into who is at risk for things like diminished ovarian reserve, which is a very common issue in reproductive endocrinology. And the only, you know, solution right now is to have, you know, maybe a donor egg if you can't get pregnant with your own autologous uh, oocyte. And so that's not, that's not a viable option for many people for many different reasons. And so, and it's not even legal in Germany. And so, you know, one of the things I think these big data sets can do is really identify, hmm, there are changes in this subset in this population. Are there any mutations? Are there any um, changes in their hormone profile? Is, is there any, um, anything that is unique about this group that gives us insight into what could be happening? And so I think, you know, tech can really drive maybe basic science. And that's what we really need in medicine. We need more physicians to be you know, able to speak tech and medicine and basic science and be able to translate between those. And I think there's some examples of companies like that, like Cellmatics, I think is doing something really cool about understanding you know, how AMH could be a contraceptive, but also trying to retard the, the reproductive aging process. And so that's an example for me that I think is really exciting because that's something you know, we didn't talk about when I was in medical school. We just said, oh, this is what happens when you go through menopause and, you know, you deal with it. And and I don't think that's acceptable anymore. I'd, then I take another question from the audience. Um, maybe we can start with you, Frederick. It's about um, asking, I think this is more from the startup side, the entrepreneurial side, which is saying whether you could elaborate on the process from having an actual idea um, for how you want to change things 
um, to going to the development process. And um, the audience member also asks if you have any tips or how one can get started. Great question. Um, I don't know, I can tell about my own experience, right? So I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm not a doctor. Um, really, I started business innovation. So my approach is really understand the user need. I think that's the core. You need to find something that's important enough to make a dent in the universe. Um, and also something that motivates yourself because it's a long journey um, and it's gonna be you know, a lot of ups and downs. So work on something that's meaningful to you. Um, and then, you know, take a step by step, really understand the user need. And if it's a new technology, it's a new product, it's a new service, um, go to that kind of prototype fast, uh, phase as fast as possible, demonstrate traction. Um, yeah, build a team. There's a lot of things to it. We can talk uh, for hours, but I think the team is also essential. Can you reread the question, please, Ariana? Um, the question was, whether you could elaborate on the process um, from having an idea to going to the actual development process and whether there are any tips. We're also, I'm just gonna quickly say, we're, we don't have that much time left. So if we wanna like get through a bunch of the audience questions, if everybody could you. Would you like me to pass or would you like me to answer quickly? No, no, uh, pa answer, of course. I'm just trying to say so we can cycle through as, as many questions as possible. Perfect, yeah. So if I think I asked you to read the question just to understand uh, exactly what they were interested in, in terms of process for, for my experience, it was um, experiencing something in myself, which was finding out about natural contraception, getting very angry at the limited um, amount of tech I had available. And then as a third step, realizing that there is so many more women that don't know about, uh, about what I didn't know. And then as a fourth step, there was another emotion of like, okay, I cannot just not do anything about it. Um, so for me, it was like an emotional journey of discovery, angerness, uh, and then discovery again. Um, how you go about it will depend on whether you need funds, I would say, or not, whether you can bootstrap it or not, depending on your business um, and your age group. I, I tend to say I was the first investor in my company because I was much earlier and I pretty much gave all my savings to it uh, um, where I could have done something else with it. Um, but there are plenty of amazing startups that don't need capital. And so you don't necessarily need to go down that route if your business doesn't need it. And I think meditation or any kind of other habit that will keep you sane is super necessary. Uh, and a close network of friend and family that um, you can go to and complain and, uh, and have a soldier to rely on for the first, I don't know, 20 years? No, I'm joking. For the first few years. Maybe just one small remark about product development. I mean, I think healthcare is a bit different. I mean, I think this whole lean movement has really captured pretty much every industry. Um, whereas in healthcare, depending on what you do, it's difficult. Um, it's not that you kind of you know, kind of iterate the new contraceptive, uh, probably. Um, so, so, so that makes it really challenging um, and, and, and very special that in healthcare, depending on what you do, of course, if you're on the consumer side of things, you may still be able to, to iterate quickly. But, but other than that, I guess that's just something that people need to be aware that this uh, kind of iterative process that you see pretty much everywhere in all other industries does not necessarily work in, in healthcare. Maybe one note on that, of course, you can't really iterate on the technology, uh, but you can really iterate on the concept that you're looking to develop. Um, so making sure that it's the right concept, the right solution. Um, I think that's what you can iterate on when you work in a space like, like ours. Fully. I'm not going to say anything because we have more questions, Ariana. Okay. Um, well, then the other question was, we, we touched upon this a bit yesterday when they were talking about innovative tracking and screening um, technologies and a difference between in places with more developed healthcare markets and developing healthcare markets. And I think this is going to be the last question in terms of time. Um, my question and the audience member's question is, yeah, how do you see that differing? How, how for when it requires more um, uh, Wi-Fi or more data, for example, for an app, um, or when you need a more robust infrastructure, 
Um, how is your approach different or are you not at all considering the still developing healthcare markets? Maybe I can take a first shot at that. I mean, I, I really think that for developing countries, we need to rethink some of the things um, that that work in the US or in uh, or in uh, in Europe, um, because very often I'm I'm just doing for a, for another project a deep dive in uh, in a project in Kenya, and I'm incredibly excited about the potential um, of of uh, digital health and solutions in Kenya. Um, but I really think you need to think um, you need to think differently to make it work. Um, I think it's not necessarily just paid by the health systems as we see it typically, or by insurances as we see it in in, in developed countries. And obviously, the disposable income can be low. So uh, I do think that concepts need to be strongly adapted. Um, but I think just the fact that if you look at, for instance, Africa, um, uh, one billion people have a smartphone or a mobile phone, most of them now smartphones out of the 1.3 billion, right? And Kenya is just starting to build a 5G network um, just now this week or so. And, the, and actually the 4G network is pretty good and covering uh, many of the, the, of the kind of uh, urban areas where people live. So, so I do think uh, digital health has, uh, will have huge impact also in developing countries uh, over the coming decade. So I'm probably with different approaches, but I'm actually uh, very excited about the potential. To say, Pascal, you, you want to go, Lena? No, I can no. be fast. I was just going to say that I think Pascal nailed it. I think that technology is, um, or the ability to connect via Wi-Fi, etc., and internet potential is uh, available pretty much everywhere in the world. The healthcare systems are not uh, equal, of course, um, but in terms of access to technology, it is available more and more. And I think that's, uh, I fully agree that uh, digital health will play a part. It will even help, I would suggest, in certain countries to the healthcare systems, the local healthcare systems to develop, I would think. Um, in terms of product, fully with Pascal, you need to understand who you build for and the environmental conditions. Uh, so probably a lot of uh, products developed for the US market won't work in developing countries, as should they should not either, right? I started out my medical career actually in West Africa, in Mali. I took a year off and I did a Fulbright and I would recommend all of the medical students to please take a year off. It's a wonderful thing to do because it really expands your horizons. And my first cell phone was in West Africa. I hadn't had a cell phone before then and everyone had a cell phone. And even my family in the US didn't have a cell phone but everyone in West Africa had a cell phone. And so I totally agree with Pascal is that you know, using the phone as, as, as actually improving healthcare outcomes can be really, really powerful. And I think one of the things that we just need to be cognizant of, and hopefully as, as all of these companies here on this panel become extremely rich, that one of the things that we can do is help invest in the infrastructure to help decrease the digital divide because there is still a digital divide. You might have a phone, but you have to you have to pay for minutes on it or you have to pay for credit on it. And you may not have money that week, but you may have money the next week. And, and we know that a lot of the people who pay for the daily use of things in the house is a woman. And it really is, is dependent on what she's making, um, maybe at the market that day or, or how much she's making from doing hair or whatever. And so we really wanna, I think, invest in the future of making sure that everyone can access the internet. Even in the US, which is a very developed nation, people were coming to the clinic to get access to Wi-Fi because they didn't have Wi-Fi at home. So if they needed to do telemedicine, they had to drive to the clinic, sit in the parking lot and connect to the Wi-Fi because they didn't have access to it at home. So in the US, you know, it could cost 70 to 120 you know, euros in US dollars, of course translated, it's to, to have Wi-Fi in the house. And so kids were getting behind in education. And, and so you can see there's a digital divide that we really, I think we can be part of the solution for. Yeah, I agree with a lot of the points here. I think it's really, yeah, on point. Um, one thing that we really think about is, um, I think human desires are very much the same if you are rich, uh, poor, uh, what country you live in. 
is really we have the same basic desires. Uh, and I think that's very important to keep in mind. And um, when we're developing, of course, we want to have a global impact as part of our vision and mission. Um, so of course we can think about some things to make sure that the product will fit into the context of these countries. Um, and that's something we are mindful of when we're developing. I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, awesome. <laughs> well, I was all I was saying was that I could actually I could listen to you all for hours. I think it's fascinating the work that you're all doing. I mean, that's why I reached out to all of you um, to have you speak on the panel. Um, unfortunately, it's bringing us to the end of our time. But I know that I and I think all the audience members uh, watching want to give you a huge thank you and also say that it's it's hugely inspiring the work that you're all doing and it makes us optimistic about where um, the field of contraception and fertility is headed. But yeah, um, a massive thank you. Um, we're going to go now to a 15 minute break before our next panel. But uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. All you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.